Fantastic. So thank you everyone for joining us today on the HR Lunch Club. Uh, we've got some fun and exciting topics for you as we work on through. As usual, it's a nice to have an interactive session. Um, so I'm just going to keep has this disappeared for some reason. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Everything's working now. So uh, thank you for joining us today. My name is Paula Squire and I'm a partner in the employment team. We deal with uh, obviously employment and HR issues when times are good and bad. Uh, and what we'll be doing today is talking you through for those who haven't um, heard things before or attended our session. We're going to be running through a few fun topics. As with all things, we always try to make sure that everything is put out at different levels. So some things you might be really familiar with, other things not. But hopefully there's always something useful in this session today. I'm joined by my very lovely co-presenter, Catherine Waters, who's a senior associate in our employment team. I don't know why I almost forgot your name then. I think I'm having one of those days today, probably. It's Easter. I think it's probably too many Easter eggs. Uh, very nicely today in the office, we were met and greeted by a number of Easter eggs on our desk and we've already cracked into one. I can't deny. So today's topics, we'll be talking a little bit about working from home and flexible working, some religious discrimination. Um, it will move on over to Catherine and she'll talk you through uh, an element of tribunal fees, some sex discrimination uh, and some key dates for your diary, just in case uh, you haven't uh, looked at those in a while. So let's get stuck in, shall we? As with all things, do drop any questions or chat in the uh, Q&A box and we'll go from there. So I thought we would kick off perhaps that it's always nice to hear what's keeping you guys busy. So um, I popped in a little list here of things that have been keeping us busy and maybe a few quick fire tips of uh, some suggestions on those topics. So recently, Catherine's been dealing with large scale investigations. She's going to wince when she sees that point. Uh, for the past month, we've been dealing with uh, a really tricky matter. And I thought perhaps Catherine might want to share with you her thoughts on, you know, in terms of a quick fire tip, anything she's learned of in terms of the, uh, dealing with a large scale investigation. Yes, of course. Uh, and good afternoon, everybody. And happy Easter for the bank holiday weekend ahead. Um, so large scale investigations, I think my number one tip is prepare, prepare, prepare um, that it, it, the temptation is always once you get a complaint or a matter that requires investigation land on your desk to delve straight in and crack on with the work. But I think the important thing to think about is what is the remit and scope of your investigation? What a, considerations in terms of governance, data protection, confidentiality need to be factored into how you actually deal with this investigation, because these are all really key matters that have certainly cropped up in the investigation I've been dealing with, but which will potentially cause issues later down the line if they're not dealt with appropriately right at the beginning. And I think another thing to, to factor into your preparations is your timeline and realistic timelines, I think, are always best. Obviously, prepare, prepare for the worst, hope for the best is often a motto that we have in our team. And many a solicitor would advise you to have in your work um, dealings. But you need to be realistic about how long things are going to take. Not only will there be human elements in terms of sickness, annual leave, etc., but as you start to delve into that investigation, it can become a much bigger base than what you've originally planned for. So it's managing expectations, preparing, and really setting out your scope and remit right from the off. Fantastic. Other things that have been keeping us busy are directed disputes. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes people just don't get along. Uh, and looking at the matters, you know, I know, I know that it, it can always be tricky when you're trying to deal with that personal element as well as, as business dealing. So that's definitely something that's been keeping us busy. I've also had a number of cases where we've been looking at um, disabled employees and really when an employer learns that someone might be disabled. And that sounds like a really simple point, but I suppose when things are going well and an employee might mention to you that they um, are suffering with a potential disability or they've been unwell for a reason and actually stopping and noting that down that time the date in some kind of file note email maybe an email back to the employee would always be best so thank you for letting me know that you've been struggling for example with your dyslexia or something similar just so that we've really got an accurate record as to when you became aware it can often be really key in terms of discrimination cases and it can be hard to put your finger on 
We've also been dealing with the number of post-termination restriction cases. And I know that sometimes people feel, and the reason I popped this in here, is that they're not worth the paper they're written on. But however, I would say that they are. And actually, we can really um, pick those issues up where someone is trying to use their relationship that stepping stone um, that they've gained from having worked with you to then try and take your customers, clients, your co-workers and colleagues and unsettle your workforce. So again, those are definitely things that we can do with it. We've also, earlier on this month, we went and, uh, as we often do, we do in-house training. So we've been presenting equality, diversity and inclusion training. And I would say that that's always really interesting to see the dynamic in the group and what perhaps employees feel would assist an employer in, in making things more equal, diverse or, or inclusive. So those ones are always really, really interesting, I would say, and something definitely worth considering in terms of your own organisation, whether you run them yourselves or whether you invite us in. And lastly, I suppose a topical question we get at least a few a week is how to deal with a short term dismissal. Now, of course, there might be some red flags that we need to consider. And always in any of our advice, we were always looking at the short punchy approach. Uh, I can't deny. And also maybe a longer approach if that's something you want to do. Uh, again, we would always weigh up and balance with you that the way you get to your end goal the quickest, but also kind of a realistic view of any risk that we might need to consider and how we would adapt around those. So from my consideration, that's perhaps something that we've been working on this month. By all means, drop into the comments and the Q&A what you've been working on this month. It'd be really interesting to see what you're looking at. I did see a comment here from John that said he's been working on contracts and new updates. So that's always worth doing. I know that we've been looking at a few in terms of new holiday pay. Uh, that you obviously you can update your contracts and roll up holiday pay and Catherine will come to that in a second. So let's move along, shall we? So I'd also thought I would touch base on as we start to head into the cases, working from home. And I don't know about you guys, but obviously the lockdown was a while ago now. I wonder what your organisation was doing. Have you changed your approach? Are you bringing people back in? We often see at the moment, I think a lot of percentages cited. So some, for example, are asking people to be in 40%, 50% if you're a manager. Maybe trainees have to be in 100%. So there's definitely um, perhaps a view or a shift. Sometimes I feel that perhaps it relates to whether or not the managing director works entirely from the office. And if they're 100 percent, then quite often workforces need to be. But it really brings us in quite nicely. And let's know your thoughts on working from home. Now, I saw this really interesting case that I thought you guys might like of Wilson and the Financial Conduct Authority. Now, Ms. Wilson had worked remotely as a senior manager during the pandemic due to health reasons. But however, post pandemic, the policy changed and staff had to come in two days a week. Now, usual staff had to come in or, or um, non-manager staff had to come in 40 percent of the time and managers had to come in 50 percent of the time. And actually, uh, Ms. Wilson had uh, obtained some quotes and some feedback from her manager to say that actually she worked really well at home. She did deal with good um, deal with and build good relationships with other colleagues whilst working from home. Uh, and despite the challenges of, of not meeting in person. So she felt her application for flexible working and her request to work entirely from home should be accepted. However, it was rejected and they said that no, there would be a negative impact upon the business. It's de detrimental to quality um, as for training and face to face meetings and also for managing staff. It's hard to do that remote. So they said no. And I think it's really interesting this one because we have seen perhaps that shift now. People saying, well, hang on, if I was able to do 100 percent from home from during the lockdown, why is it? that I can't do it now. And I think there's often that expectation that you can't then say no because you've done it before. Now, I would say that Ms. Wilson was this very senior employee. She was on 140000 per year, so no small amount of money. She'd been there since 2005. She, she'd worked there a long time. She, she alleged that her case was based on incorrect facts and that actually the FCA should allow her to um, work from home. However, the court agreed that actually the employer are able to say that she is not allowed to work from home. I wonder if the case would have been any different had Ms. Wilson been a little less uh, inflexible, and forgive the pun. She'd refused to come in for any meetings, supervision. She wanted to entirely be 100% from home and not come in at all. So I wonder whether that has a little bit of an impact had she been a little less inflexible and agreed that she'd come in for to meet some business need. Perhaps this decision would have been different. But I do think it's a really nice case example that you can change your approach just because someone worked from home during lockdown doesn't mean that you'd necessarily uh, have to agree the request now. Which brings us on really nicely, I suppose, to the new laws that are coming in from the 6th of April 2024 and that making flexible working requests now a day one right as opposed to from 26 weeks. Employees can make uh, more than one request a year. They can make two requests a year, but I won't steal Catherine's thunder. I know she's going to come to that in a little bit. So again, it's just a little marker there that things are changing. 
Which brings us to an action point. Why are you listening to this? You want to know what you need to do in your day to day jobs. And I would say that we've been we've been spending in the past few weeks updating a lot of our clients handbooks. Um, as you'll see, the amendments of flexible working policies and regime do mean that your existing policies will be out of date. Also, a new addition of carers leave, which Catherine will walk us through in just a moment, um, again means that due to this new creation, we're seeing a new policies. And also members of the paternity leave. Now that the way you can take your leave is changing, it does mean that your older policies will be out of date. So let us know if you'd like to take advantage of our fixed fee of £500 plus VAT to update your handbooks. And again, whilst we're looking at them, we'll let you know if anything else needs changing. Uh, we're also working on, quite quite interestingly, um, AI in the workplace. And I think it's that element of AI can be really interesting. And do look back over our previous um, sessions where Catherine has a really deep dive into AI in the workplace. Um, I think it was a couple of sessions ago now. Uh, and obviously, generative AI, AI can be really great. My son is an absolutely uh, proficient, trust but all of his homework through it. But at the same time, it is something that you don't necessarily want certain financial information, confidential information being used. There are real issues of confidentiality, ethical considerations, potential breaches. So again, it might be worth like we did at the data protection point, it is worth considering whether or not you have a policy that's uh, obviously tailored to your approach. Maybe you have certain platforms you do allow people to use, but maybe you just need to be careful about what they do and don't put in them. Or alternatively, maybe we just want them to use certain things or, or certain um, not make sure that they don't use prohibited platforms. So again, let us know if those are of interest to you. We're drafting those for 450 plus VAT. But as we go forward, I suppose I also wanted to consider with you what you can and can't say at work. I do find sometimes the boundaries of what you can and can't say often seems to be a topic for dispute. I know we saw it around, um, you know, obviously Pride Month and things like that. We obviously had whilst a lot of employers are trying to promote and encourage diversity at the same time. Obviously, it does polarise views in terms of what is and isn't acceptable. And obviously, with different wars in other countries, of course, again, those types of views can be polarised. And when they come into the workplace, obviously, what do you need to be considering and what does that look like? Which really brings us to one of our cases here, which is uh, Uber and Michael Garrett Associates. Now, West End Star um, say she... Uh, was cast in a lead role of Seely, uh, but was a les lesbian character in the colour purple. Now, unfortunately, as all things, she posted a Facebook post sometime before, which had somehow resurfaced, and someone asked her if she stood by her view. And her view was at the time that she didn't believe in homosexuality was a right. Um, unfortunately, she wouldn't back down. She wouldn't retract or apologise that statement. She was given the impact um, and she her contract was terminated. She was no longer able to play the role. She brought a claim for religious discrimination, saying she was a Christian and that this was harassment and belief. She has a right to put forward her views uh, and not to lose her job because of it. And I thought it was quite interesting, the case discussed where someone has an objectionable manifestation of belief. It's quite an interesting phrase, that one, isn't it? That their, their belief is in some way objectionable to somebody else. And in this, this obviously modern times, people are more confident in sharing their views, um, and perhaps rightly so, of course, but also people take offence to those views. So, of course, she lost out on her role, and she felt it was an impact upon her freedom of expression. She uh, unfortunately she lost in the employment tribunal, and they said actually the reason they contracted her, they terminated her contract, was not because of her religious view. It was actually because of the commercial viability of the production, and that if they would carried on, they'd have had an array of negative publicity, and of course potentially um, that would have impacted upon the play itself. So um, I suppose that's a good, I suppose that's a good example where there's actually more evidence of the actual impact as opposed to just the religious belief. Because I think sometimes it can feel like it's too hot to touch, but at the same time you can have a, a you know a justified reason. And actually, interesting in this case, she brought it all the way through to the Employment Appeal Tribunal, and she was actually awarded um, she was actually awarded costs against her, and she had to pay her at the 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 theatre groups cost of £300,000 for pursuing that one. So it's definitely a unique on its facts, but I do think it's something that's relevant and you need to consider if indeed you're trying to dismiss someone for sharing their views. Which is very similar, uh, again, to a recent case, and maybe because we're down here in the southwest, uh, University of Bristol, I thought it was quite an interesting one, um, where, again, Mr Miller had expressed his views. He was a lecturer, and he'd been expressing his views on, on Israel and Palestine. Um, he was dismissed from his role for gross misconduct after he received complaints from students. And I suppose it's similar to when we see other cases where people are dismissed, where you have complaints from customers and clients. So it definitely brought something out when I was looking at the facts of, of that matter. Now, he said that, you know what, that was my belief, that was my political belief was something that I believe in. It's genuinely held. It played a really significant part in his life. You know, he developed, 
he'd dedicated his academic life to pursuing it um and his beliefs were coherent and cogent so so it is something that they didn't go too far they weren't um, anti-semitic but actually it was his dismissal was a manifestation of his beliefs and actually he'd done this one he was successful they did say actually um you know that was uh it was his belief it was a protected right and therefore to be dismissed because of it was unfair so definitely an interesting one Again, as I take a whistle-stop tour through cases that I find interesting, by all means, always let us know if there's a particular topic you'd like us to talk about. Um, always drop us a quick line or an email. We're always welcome to hear those. But I did see another interesting case. Otherwise, you have to put up with what we find interesting. But um, I, I do like this one because it definitely manifested with a few issues we've had recently with some of our clients. And in this case, the case of Abbas and ISS Facility Services was around Miss Abbas was the only female employee stationed at a particular work site where they only had one washroom, one toilet, where she had to walk past two urinals to go to one cubicle. Now, you might think that that must be quite the small employer, really, to, to only have one, one cubicle, not something we have here at Clark Um, But actually, it was an employer who employed 10,000 staff, which I thought was quite a significant employer to have such poor facilities. Now, she complained of poor hygiene. She didn't want to have to walk past men to go into the, the ladies. She complained to her manager that there wasn't a lock. Um, and that there wasn't a sign. Her manager then sellotaped the word ladies to the door, kept falling off, she had to keep re-sticking it, never good. And, and obviously, you know, with some gaffer tape trying to fix the lock. After three years, and I thought that's quite a significant time to live with such a problem, she brought a claim of direct discrimination. She'd been off, she'd had enough, she'd gone off with sick, on sick leave with stress. Um, and while she was away, they had actually fixed the cubicle until she came back to her own facilities. And I thought it was quite interesting because it really shows perhaps the she'd lived with it for a really long time, three years, and that they'd actually fixed the problem. And yet it was at that point that she brought a claim. Now, she actually received £15,000 for injury to feelings. There was an element there of there was a one-off act of sexual harassment, but most of it was in relation to the facilities. And I think it shows you that if you've got an employee who has a problem, they can still stand and sue. They can still work with you and bring a claim. They can say, I've had a problem, you fixed it, but actually that was unfair and it's it's upset me and it's injured my feelings uh, and the judge happened to make a comment which I suppose is quite true no woman or girl should walk past your rhinos to get to the toilet no man should have the risk of someone walking past them you know it's put quite simply isn't it but I do think it's that element of allowing things to ride in your own organizations where um you know people have really complained but you know it's a little bit of a risk so I think you know just because someone hasn't left you just yet doesn't mean it's not necessarily a problem that you need to deal with and dealing with things quickly when problems are arose you know it being three years is never a good thing and we've seen it before when people raise complaints you do have to remember if you go to tribunal and we're looking at that bundle and Catherine and I deal with lots of discrimination cases you do have to justify what happened each day you know each week each month what was the passage of time and what happened during that period so it's not really acceptable to leave it too long um in the overall thing so no matter how fairly you feel you act do check that you're moving in a, in a good pace which brings me on over and i'm going to hand over now to the lovely catherine who's going to talk you through a few more things thanks Paula. that's some interesting cases there so hopefully helpful for for everyone in the audience um, so the first thing I was going to touch on today was just about employment tribunal fees. Um, I'm sure a lot of the audience will remember that from 2013 to 2017, employment tribunal fees were a thing. And there was a lot of controversy at the time. And Unison brought a big case, which was successful in the end. And the Supreme Court ruled that employment tribunal fees were an unlawful restriction on justice. So out the fees went and we reverted to the system of old, which was that it was a non fee paying um, system for the tribunal and claimants could bring fees or claims as and when they wished. Now, I'm sure a lot of people will remember that during that period when the fees were in place, understandably, perhaps there was a, a big drop off in the number of claims that were being brought in the employment tribunal. And we certainly have seen a huge surge in claims since the fees were removed. And it's now on the horizon that this fee structure is going to be put back in place, albeit slightly differently. 
Now, why is this the case? Um, I think for a number of reasons, really. The Employment Tribunal is one of the only systems in the, in England where you don't have to pay for any fees in terms of bringing a claim. Obviously, in the civil courts, high courts, you, you do bring um, and have to pay to bring your claim. But in the Employment Tribunal, you don't. And obviously, that has financial implications, as you would imagine, in terms of the government and for the taxpayer. So it is considered, and I should say it's a consultation that was open until Tuesday of this week, or, or perhaps that's Wednesday or Monday of this week, the 25th anyway, where it is the it's be, people were being consulted to make a decision. So the proposed fee regime is based on three main principles, affordability, proportionality and simplicity. Now, it's going to be two separate fees, £55 each, one for issuing in the tribunal and a separate employment tribunal fee, as I've said on the slide, per judgment, decision, direction or order appealed. There will, however, be financial support for those on a low income. And I guess it's just a case of let's wait and see what's decided following the closure of this consultation. Now, the main topic I wanted to raise with you today is this issue of sexual harassment in the workforce which unfortunately is an issue that is becoming more and more prevalent, I would say, um, in most workforces. And certainly the media has picked up on this. And in the last year alone, there have been numerous celebrities, huge corporate employers um, who have been found to have fallen foul of the sexual harassment laws. Now, I've included the definition of sexual harassment on the slide here, which obviously comes from the Equality Act, and it's unwanted conduct of a sexual nature that has the purpose or effect of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment. Now, it's easy to assume that this is just a uh, female issue and that males don't, don't suffer from any sexual harassment, but that would be wrong to have that assumption. Obviously, employees, workers, contractors, self-employed people and job applicants are all covered and protected by this legislation and it is not solely a female issue. Now, one thing that was in the media last year and was very high profile was the problems that McDonald's were actually having around this area. Now, in November of last year, the Food Change Chief Executive of UK and Ireland admitted that um, McDonald's are facing at least one to two complaints of sexual harassment per week. They've also said that in a four month period, they received a total of more than 400 allegations of sexual harassment. Now, to me, that are those are shocking figures. But as we move on to the next slide, it seems to be something that correlates with the statistics that I sort of sourced when I was preparing this talk. Um, I think once you look at statistics, it put th puts things into focus. And as the statistics on the screen here show, it is a, a male as well as female problem. It's also a significant problem in the workplace as well, obviously, in general life, but particularly an issue for younger members of staff, which I think would probably tie in with the McDonald's model, their um, operation model, where they have a lot of part time staff and, and a much younger workforce, I would say, than many other employers. So what obviously is sexual harassment? Well, this it covers not only spoken words or, or anything in writing. It covers social media posts, mimicry, graffiti, facial expressions and of course, physical gestures. So it's not just a case that, you know, you have to watch out for any email or letter or text message. This is something that could affect people in various different ways. So we have to really be on the lookout. So why, most importantly, for you guys in your role as, as HR, would you need to be really alert to this? 
Well, it goes without without saying really that any sexual harassment is going to affect staff well-being, whether it be from a mental or, or physical well-being perspective, but that in turn will have implications for the employer. When employees are unwell, of course, their absence is affected and that can affect your productivity. It can lead to difficulties in sustaining a workforce, particularly if people feel that this is a place where they don't want to be and they tell their friends and family. Even if you don't face claims, you can face commercial and reputational consequences. And also, and I'm sure a lot of you would agree and what you've probably started to see more in your recruitment practices, is candidates are now becoming much more alert and, and conscious and focused on companies' environmental, social and government agendas and policies. Long gone are the days when employers were sought after solely because of how much they were prepared to pay employees. You know, the workforce nowadays are a lot more conscious of how they're going to be treated. They're obviously much more alert of their rights and what their entitlements are. And also they're more socially and environmentally aware as well. I know we've acted for many clients um, across the firm where even when they're applying for finance for different things, you know, those finance providers are asking them to justify and explain what their environmental, social and governance policies and, and agendas are. So this is something that really we would advise is on the forefront of your mind. So sexual harassment in the workforce, or in the workplace, sorry, it's governed by different legislation, which I've noted here on this slide. Now, of course, you may all be familiar with the vicarious liability that employers may face, which is governed under the Equality Act. And this is where employers can be vicariously liable for any discrimination by their employees if this is done in the course of their employment. The only defence that employers will have to this claim is where they've taken reasonable steps and they're able to evidence that they've taken reasonable steps to prevent this. Now, building on this and perhaps probably more aligned with what's happening in the media and the world at large in light of Me, um, Me Too campaigns, the um, Equality and Human Rights Commission and the um, Equality, Women and Equality Select Committee in 2018 really looked at this issue of sexual harassment and they're led by the Liberal Democrat um, MP, Weira Hobhouse. There was real movement in terms of trying to get mandatory protection for employees in terms of how they're treated in the workforce regarding this issue. So they were successful and we now have the Worker Protection Amendment of Equality Act 2010, which will come into force from October of this year, so October 24, and it will make a mandatory, introduce, sorry, a mandatory duty for employers to take reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment of employees. Now, this is a positive duty and it's different and more onerous from the, the vicarious liability defence under the Equality Act because there's potential 25% uplift for compensation awarded to employees who are successful in their claims if the employer is unable to evidence that they have taken steps to prevent sexual harassment. Um, this is a, a duty that will be enforced by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and it's something that really needs to be on your horizon now. So the Equality and Human Rights Commission is not going to introduce new code of practice regarding this. Instead, what it said it will do is it will update the existing code of practice and technical guidance in this area. And we are awaiting this to happen. However, we would advise that you don't wait for this updated guidance and instead you start to take action on this now. So what exactly can you do to try and act on this or how should you be dealing with sexual harassment? Well, 
this is a, an issue that is largely underreported. The statistics are very clear on this, that while it's a prevalent issue, you know, a lot of people surveyed when asked if they report this, they said that they don't. So a lot of workplaces don't recognise the extent of the problem. I think it would be easy to think, of course, that there was no problem if you're not getting complaints in on HR desks saying that this is an issue. But I think it would be naive to assume that no such issues are in your workforce. I think what we would recommend is taking steps to try and recognise and risk assess the extent of the problem within your organisation. Now, suggestions of how you could do this are introducing some anonymous surveys, perhaps on an annual basis, I would suggest, where employees can feel that they have the comfort of being able to flag any issues without them being identified and potentially facing any repercussions for doing so. Have a look at your organisation as well in terms of any particular areas where you think this could be an issue. For example, where there's a power imbalance, it's, it's very possible that this could be an issue. If there is a particular prevalence of employees of a particular sex, that also may cause some issues. But monitor the situation, you know, look and see if there's any patterns in terms of complaints that you do receive. Obviously, when, when any complaint is received, it goes without saying that you should be fully and thoroughly investigating this. And you should have very clear and probably in line with um, the anonymous surveys, consider anonymous reporting mechanisms. Now, having a zero tolerance workplace culture, which um, provides that sexual harassment will not be tolerated in any way, shape or form is very important. And it's most important for this to be a message that is led and driven from the top. If your senior managers and, and your managing directors and business owners are all living by these principles, that really is testament to the culture that your, your workforce will understand and that they will recognise and, and acknowledge. Obviously, you can make sure that any correspondence is issued in line with the zero culture policy. And it's important to regularly review and update your anti-harassment and dignity at work policies and procedures. I think having regular and targeted staff training around this issue is vitally important. It's not just appropriate to have a short induction session training about sexual harassment to, to follow through with um, what it, you believe is expected. It's really important that this is regularly reviewed, regularly delivered and look at how it is delivered for those people who are um, expected to address any complaints that are raised. We would suggest that having separate targeted um, training around how to deal with that is always appropriate. And this is something that we can we can assist you with very happily. And that's a really good point, Catherine. We obviously go in, I, I did one a couple of months ago, and uh, deal with respect to work training. And it is interesting. And I think we can all think of times when you know, I don't know people have been inappropriate or we've seen things or heard things. Uh, and I suppose it's that power imbalance, isn't it? If it is younger, younger people are affected, maybe they're trainees in your organisation, apprentices, younger elements, you know, how comfortable do they truly feel of raising those issues? And I do think, you know, I've seen certain training sessions where people just click the button on the screen and try to move on through it. But I do personally like looking at the, the individual approach that we try to run. Um, of going into organisations, talking to them about what it is, using really real examples or examples that are a bit on the cusp for, for a little bit of fun, really, just to try and bring the issue to life. You know, are you allowed to comment on the way people smell? Are you allowed to comment on the way people dress, you know, or they like a particular pair of trousers? What what does that look like? And really trying to engage that discussion and talk about the zero tolerance approach so that employees can see and feel and get an understanding that maybe if they did raise it or say something to someone, 
that it would be okay or that they could have a quiet chat if something isn't quite going well. And I do think it's, you know, really putting your money where your mouth is. How much did your organisation really try to bring out this complaint? How they really dealt with are people that are perhaps a little bit more, um, you know, kind of newly in post. How, how comfortable do they feel making a complaint about their boss? And who would they go to? And how would they know how that's received? And they don't really know unless you have that training at least once a year or, once, or twice a year. Some of our clients run. And again, let us know if that's of interest to you. Absolutely. And I think it feeds into, you know, what we are seeing now in the workforce in terms of people being more alert and aware of what their rights are and, and what they will tolerate. Because like you said, Paul, in days gone by, you know, people particularly where there was that power imbalance and people were at the very early part of their career, they wanted to impress, they wanted to progress within a, an organisation, they maybe would have put up and, and not said anything anything, you know, to upset the apple cart. But that certainly doesn't seem to be the case moving forward. McDonald's is testament to that, isn't it? And the issues that they're facing. So that leads me on quite nicely to, to um, just tell you guys a little bit about a, a recent case in this area. Now, this was a case brought by Miss Hunter, who worked for the supermarket chain Lidl. She brought a claim in the Employment Tribunal just last year, in fact, around sexual harassment. Now, what she, Miss, Lidl, Miss Hunter's circumstances were that she started working for Lidl as a customer assistant in 2019. At the time, she was studying for her A-levels, so this was a job around her studies, as is often the case with, with a lot of of, um, with a lot of younger employees. Now, she progressed very well. She showed great promise. And in 2020, she was promoted to shift manager. However, in July 21, she resigned, claiming constructive dismissal, sex discrimination, harassment, equal pay and unauthorised deduction from wages. Now, that was a very big bag of claims that was landing on Lidl's desk. So every employer's worst nightmare, I would suggest. Now, this claim related to her allegations that she had been repeatedly subjected to unwanted advances and inappropriate comments by colleagues and a deputy manager. In actual fact, in the store that she worked, there was a, uh, a great changeover of management during that short period of time. And there were a number of different managers that were named in her claim. Um, and she had said that the way she was dealt with and spoken to or insinuate or innuendos made, very sexual innuendos, you know, there was unwanted physical advances, like I've said, and it was just completely inappropriate. She mentioned there was a lack of training for staff at all levels on what was acceptable and that there was this culture within the organisation or within that store, at least, that this was acceptable. Now, Miss Hunter did raise complaints about how she was being treated and, and the fact she felt it was inappropriate with management. And she raised these mostly on a verbal basis. And however, there was one com one complaint at least that she put in writing. But what Miss Hunter said is that these complaints were just shrugged or shrugged off. She, she was actually told that she should take it as a compliment, and the managers weren't surprised. So she brought her claim. What what do we think that the outcome of this complaint was? Well, I'll not leave you in suspense. She was successful in most of her claims. So sexual harassment, equal pay, unfair dismissal and unauthorised deduction from wages. She succeeded. Now, the Employment Tribunal commented on the culture within the store and it found that Lidl was vicariously liable for the actions of its employees. It mentioned, and the judgment refers to, there being no evidence of reasonable steps to prevent harassment. For example, there was no evidence of staff or management training in this area. So all coming back to the steps that we were, we were talking about. And let's not forget, this is prior to the new mandatory duty coming into effect from this October. So Miss Hunter was awarded compensation in and around the £50,000 mark 
a lot of money, so a big a big issue for Lidl, really. So now just to, to wrap up, and, and we're conscious that you're busy, so we don't want to delay you any further. But in addition to the changes that Paula's already mentioned, which just for time, I won't rehearse for you now, but obviously let us know if you need any further information around these. I've just set out here some little um, key dates for your diary. Now, most of you are aware that as usually happens in April, the national minimum wage increases. So quite a significant increase for workers aged over 21, up to £11.44 an hour. Now, discussions with our employer clients are that this can sometimes be problematic and it's important to really look and make sure that the work workers that you have for you are, are really bringing it home and earning that money that, that's a much greater expense for you going forward. Equally with paternity leave, there's some in, in improvements there, I suppose, for expectant fathers, whereby from the 6th of April, paternity leave can be taken as two non-consecutive blocks of one week. Now, these employees will still need to give notice. It's 28 days notice. So rest assured, you will still be able to have some preparatory time, but it's just useful for you to, to take into account and maybe a benefit for you where you don't lose that valuable employee for two weeks, two consecutive weeks at a time. Um, and finally then, holiday entitlement and holiday pay calculations. Now, this is a topic that we covered in our last seminar, um, but again, if you if it would be helpful to have any further information on this, please just let us know. But from the 1st of April, part year and irregular hours workers, their holiday entitlement and holiday pay calculations are going to, to change slightly. Now, this will be welcome news for many of you in light of the Harper Brazil judgment a few years back. And there's now an option whereby holiday can be paid at the time when it's taken and calculated using a 52 week average. Or alternatively, you can revert to the practice of old, which is to pay rolled up holiday pay based on a calculation of 12.07% of entitlement. So that brings us to the end of our session. So I think we're going to stop sharing our screen and see if we have any questions that anybody's jumped into the chat. Perfect. And obviously just let us know if you need any assistance. And obviously we also offer a free contract and handbook of you. We popped us at the end of the slides so a few dates for the rest of the year. We kind of got going and booked them in the diary. For the rest of the sessions, always let us know if there's something you, you'd like us to talk about. I was thinking maybe we might do a key key topic conversation on the next one. Maybe redundancy, poor performance, sick employees, tell us which one you like the best. Um, probably which one you like the least, and that's one we'll talk about. Um, and also we are going to be running our usual every year session on essential HR and employment training. So what we'll do is you're absolutely right, let's stop sharing our screen um, and then we will see if we can pull up the Q&A and if you've got any questions, anything interesting, anything that's that's um, taking up your time of the day or any questions, then by all means do let us know. Catherine's being a whiz with the screen. She's able to, to pop some things in. Perfect. Just taking a look. Um, OK, just having a quick read of that one. David's made a comment about how often he's dealing with redundancies at the moment. And, and again, I think we've seen that a few in terms of bad times, isn't it, in certain industries. Some of our um, some of our clients who deal with buildings and, and construction. That's probably the one I was looking for. Um, obviously going through some redundancies, maybe smaller scale, one or two employees, etc. So again, that's definitely, definitely something we're seeing as well. But I think also maybe when we are advising on those ones, sometimes you don't have to go through the full process. Sometimes you can begin, have a discussion and sometimes we are seeing clients who then um, move to perhaps a you know, payment in lieu of notice, maybe a few extra pennies to move it into a kind of a quicker process that doesn't mean you have to go through through full consultations, obviously subject to signing an agreement usually. Um, so sometimes it is that kind of punchy approach and, and other approaches as well. So that one can be quite interesting. I'll just check the chat as well because I think sometimes we see questions in there as well. Fantastic. 
Perfect. Well, unless we've got any other questions, I think we'll let you all disappear. Off to enjoy your Easter eggs. I know that we will. I've left ours on our Catherine's desk, so it looks like she's eating it rather than me. Um, but that's always a good one. So thank you so much. Have a really good long weekend. Any queries, always pick up the phone. Always, always bug us and, and, and ask us anything you'd like us to, to take a look at. We're always happy to, to have a chat. So we'll leave you to your lovely bank holiday. Thanks for joining us today for our slightly discrimination special. I think it kind of ended up that. We probably should have popped that right at the beginning. Um, but yeah, thank you so much.